You know, if you look at all the professions, law enforcement specifically, it's police use of force that has generated a lot of, you know, unrest. You know, Ben mentioned it before, objectively reasonable is the standard for all of those. But we have to kind of put ourselves in that officer's position of, okay, here's what they knew at that time. Is that reasonable given that information? We're oftentimes having to make these decisions in a split second. Inaction itself can create harm for the public. It can also create harm for the officer. And if you don't come into this profession with a high amount of character, it can be very easy to go above and beyond what you should do as an officer. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another episode of the Wausau PD podcast. Uh, glad that you could join us. I'm Todd Baton. I'm the deputy chief at the police department, and I'm joined today by Captain Ben Graham from our investigations bureau and Lieutenant John Phillips, who is part of our patrol bureau. And we're going to get to know a little bit more about them and, and actually why you guys are here in a second. But I just I just wanted to point out that today's episode, we want to talk about use of force issues. Um and, and I'll, I guess I'll throw it right back to you guys um, and see if you agree or disagree. But I would say that of, of all the facets of law enforcement, um, the one that maybe has the, the greatest potential for conversation or misunderstanding or controversy is, is probably use of force, um, mainly because of some, some pretty uh, conspicuous national incidents that have occurred. Um, there's, and there's a lot of things that, that, that really go into use of force. So maybe you could just explain a little bit of like what your training and background and role at the department is as it relates to force. You want to start or you want me to go? Just how it's going to go. We'll cut I'll, out that I'll, pause. Go, I'll go first. <laughs> we'll cut out that no, pause. I mean, I think, I think, uh, the deputy chief makes a really good point in that, you know, if you look at all the professions and law enforcement specifically, look at the history of America, I mean, it's police use of force that has generated a lot of, you know, unrest. Uh, you have the Watts riots, you have Rodney King, you have George Floyd. And so there are, um, you know, a lot of things that go into uh, law enforcement that have the potential to lead to a lot of unrest uh, nationwide. And so that's part of why it's important to talk about use of force and and I think partly why we're here today. So Ben, let me just ask, what um, you, you have some training credentials. Uh, you've been an instructor for the department um, on a variety of topics relating to force. What would some of those things be? So I'm an instructor in defensive and arrest tactics and professional communications. Okay, excellent. And John, let's learn a little bit more about you. Yeah, so I've been an instructor since 2011 for firearms, um, for tactical response, and then also I'm a taser instructor, less lethal instructor as well. And then one of my roles here is the lead tactical uh, officer. So I'm responsible for kind of coordinating all of our department training um, and then also reviewing use of force um, all the reports that come through. Myself and two of the other lieutenants review those and um, I'm sure we'll talk more about that here yeah. today too. Perfect. Thank you. Um, well, maybe, yeah, because it is, there's a lot that goes into this topic and um, some of the things might be new concepts to, to listeners or viewers. And so maybe you guys decide how you want to do this. You could give us a, a foundational understanding of use of force as it relates to law enforcement um, what is that like? What does it entail? What are some of the various kind of levels or scales or options as it relates to force? But that might give us a springboard into a, a more deeper conversation about the topic as a whole. So, like Ben said, uh, the defense and arrest tactics, or DAT, we call it, this, uh, that system is a set of um, physical skills coupled with our verbalization. So, it right there emphasizes that us talking with individuals um, is important to set everything up. So it's broken up into different categories um, and kind of uh, the disturbance resolution model is what it's called. So you've got presence, 
an officer merely being there, the presence, and we'll talk more about that. You have dialogue, again, us talking to somebody. You have control alternatives, protective alternatives, and then deadly force. And there's different tools and tactics that we train and teach that would fall within each one of those categories. And I would just add that, you know, John mentions that it's a, a system. And uh, James Clear wrote a book called Atomic Habits. And one of the quotes from his book is that, you know, people have goals, but we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. And so this system that has been with us, at least for the past 16 years that I've been a law enforcement officer, um, is designed to be able to resolve incidents without any use of force. But we know that force is going to be required uh, from time to time. And when force is used, we need it to be objectively reasonable or only use the smallest amount of force necessary to be able to accomplish a lawful objective. And when I uh, have the pleasure of providing some training that's in addition to what recruits get in recruit school called crisis intervention team training, one of the um, stories or analogies that I talk about is the fact that we want our officers to be salty. And usually when you say you're salty, that's a, a negative you know, phrasing. But what I'm trying to get at is if we think about the two historical uses of salt, what, what, have, what has it been used for? It's been used for things like preserving, you know, preserving meat way back before we had refrigeration, right? They, you know, packed the meat in salt. It would take out all the moisture and it would last much longer. And then on the other hand, it's like the table salt that you have at home. You know, it enhances flavor. And that's really what our aim is as law enforcement officers. It's to preserve life and liberty. And it's also to enhance quality of life. And this system, which is the DAT system, is a system of verbalization skills coupled with physical alternatives it begins with this verbalization. And hopefully, through the course of being great communicators, we're able to resolve and fix and deal with certain situations in ways where we don't have to go hands-on with, with people. And so with kind of that overarching philosophy of, hey, wanting to preserve life and liberty, wanting to enhance quality of life, that's really the... 30,000 foot philosophy of, you know, what use of force is about. Great. Thank you. Well, you, you talked about, um, you mentioned presence, John, like how important is that? Or, I mean, as, as you said that, I'm thinking, well, that's, that's certainly the, the more frequent thing that's going to be happen. Every time an officer is making contact with an individual out in the community, there is this this personal connection, there is a, a physical presence that that officer has there. Um, how important is that in terms of setting the stage for that interaction? Like what, what type of, uh, what, what training would, would be in that vein for officers in terms of their officer presence? Yeah, it's really important that how they carry themselves. You know, what the person sees first and foremost is the visible show of force, right? Or what a law enforcement officer actually represents. So showing up in a squad car, showing up in, in your uniform with your equipment and how you carry yourself. So when we teach recruits, when we teach you know new officers too, having that confidence going into that, no matter what the situation is, that's really important because like you said, it kind of sets the stage for, for how it's going to play out. You know, with that person, even before we start talking to them or using any of the physical um, tactics or tools that we have available to us. So I know you have a good example of the the breakdown of communication. I know I've heard before. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the things that we talk about when we emphasize the power of presence is the seven thirty eight fifty five rule. And what that basically says is, when it comes to communication and influence, seven percent is what we actually say, the words that come out of our mouth. The 38 is the tone of voice, and we have a tremendous toolbox of range and register and prosody, pace, rhythm, all those different things that we need to adjust in order to be our most effective in communication. But the 55% is what John is talking about. It's our body language. I mean, if we think about all of us have probably been in this situation where we're driving south on 51. We're singing to our favorite song. We're not paying attention. And all of a sudden, we see that trooper in the turnaround. What happens reflexively? Well, 
regardless of whether or not we're speeding. We speed up. No, oh. we don't. No, our our foot comes off the gas. Our, you know, we begin to sweat a little bit. Heart begins to race a little bit. We, you know, look down at the speedometer, make sure that we're not speeding. But that's just, you know, a picture of the power of simple presence, showing up or sitting in a turnaround. Every time an officer shows up on a call, how they carry themselves communicates something greatly, and it can conflict with what we're actually trying to say. And so we, we talk in recruit school, we talk in training after recruit school about just the importance of facial expression, about our posture, what we choose to do with our arms, where we place our hands, um, all those different things so that we're truly getting across what we want to get across. And uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of an art and you, you grow in your ability to, to communicate um, months, years into this profession. And, and like I said, the goal at the end of the day is to get voluntary compliance from people. Sure. No, I appreciate that analogy. And yeah, yeah I, I still do that every time I see that trooper in the, I, I do that when I see a WASA officer behind me. I mean, and I live two miles from the police department and I think pretty much everybody knows what car I drive and i um, not driving too crazy out there. Uh, so if, if the uniform and the mark squad and the badge and all those kinds of things are sort of this um, physical manifestation of of the authority granted to the officer, and now it plays out in in that presence and and to a certain degree also in that dialogue as you're talking, where where does that law enforcement authority really come from to begin with? The authority to um, use force if necessary when um, ad addressing issues out in our community? Maybe uh, one or both of you want to take a, take a stab at that. I can, I can start quick. Sure. All right, I'll be brief. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think it comes, first of all, from Wisconsin statute and from the Constitution as well. We're, we're given authority to be able to use what we call privilege. Um, so we get to use force that could be criminal, but if you take the facts, the circumstances, it's allowable under the law. But I think it's important to point out that where does statute and the Constitution come from? It comes from the people. And so that's why it's so important for us to, to behave in ways that comport with our policy, Wisconsin statute, uh, and federal law to make sure that we don't lose the public's trust. Because at the end of the day, that's where our authority comes from. It comes from the people who get together and they come up with laws. And then there's judicial precedent that also helps to define what we can and cannot do as officers. John, anything to add? Yeah, no, I think Ben did a really good uh, foundation principle there. It's kind of bro it's broken down into like five different categories or most common. Right? We have achieve, maintain control of a resistive subject. So whatever we're trying to do, we have a subject that um, we're going to go hands-on with, and we'll talk more about that, that we're going to achieve, maintain control. So the level of force um, could be used for that. Uh, detaining individuals reasonably suspected of a crime. So we're still in the investigative process. Um, we haven't risen to the level of an arrest just yet, but we can detain people and put them in handcuffs or use a level of force um, to start there. Then make lawful arrests. So when we make an arrest, we're going to place someone in handcuffs. There could be a level of force there as well. Um, you have the most common one, probably what most people would think of, is the defense of yourself and others. So we are able to defend ourselves, but then it also extends to we can use force to then defend somebody else from harm as well. If we're called somewhere, somebody's called us for help, we can defend them and use a level of force as well. And then finally, to prevent escape. So that could be somebody fleeing from us before we've made the arrest or, you know, we're in the process of making an arrest and they're fleeing. And, you know, Ben mentioned it before, objectively reasonable is the standard for all of those. And we'll also look at like the severity of the crime, you know, how and what level of force would be appropriate for any of those circumstances when we're called to a barking dog complaint is going to be looked at differently than if we're called there for, you know, a very violent, you know, domestic situation or somebody trying to kill somebody else, you know, e extreme level. Those are going to be different, you know, and the circumstances and what we know going into it, the 
information that we gather when we get there as well or through interviews are all going to play into, you know, what the officer then decides and how we would review it as well at the end. Okay, what's everything that the officer knew, perceived, um, and did in that moment? And look at that. And it's going to fall most likely in one of those five categories or multiple too. Gotcha. You said a phrase in there, objectively reasonable. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe just so all the viewers or listeners understand, like what – what does that phrase mean in the context of law enforcement use of force, particularly in, in review of that force? What does is, what is objectively reasonable mean? So it's the situation or the facts known to an officer with similar training or experience for that given situation. So it's not hindsight 2020, hey, now we have everything. We'll look at that afterwards, but we have to kind of put ourselves in that officer's position of, okay, here's what they knew at that time. Is that reasonable given that information? Because there's always more information available afterwards that we didn't know at that particular moment, right? So that's that's where it's coming from is in that split second decision where the officer has to look at what they're going to do or how they react that's what we're basing it off of. Gotcha. That's that objective, reasonable standard. Um, and that objectively reasonable phrasing comes from a, a court case called Graham v. Connor. Um, I had no involvement in making that, despite my last name being Graham. But yeah, as as John talks about, there's you know a couple different things involved, and that is the fact that hey, when we evaluate use of force. We're, we're not Monday morning quarterbacking it necessarily. Um, what we're trying to do is put ourselves in the shoes of that officer, given the conditions, the officer's training, experience, that fact situation, and what is available to them in that particular moment uh, to help be able to assess whether their use of force was justified in our eyes or not. Uh, so that when it's not, we're able to correct and remediate and conduct further training to make sure that uh, we're playing by the rules at the end of the day. Um, and I think just to drive home the point that John made, that we're oftentimes having to make these decisions in a split second. It's not like we have all day to be able to make these decisions. In action itself can create harm for the public. It can also create harm for the officer or maybe undue harm to the offender. That's before the officer as well. And so those are two critical things that uh, our officers need to think about. And as instructors and reviewers of use of force, we need to think about those things too. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. So, I mean, clearly you guys are setting the stage for um, how complex of an issue this truly can be, that there's a lot of things that go into decision-making processes that uh, officers are having to deal with as they're out responding to the variety of incidents to which they do respond. So as we're continuing to lay the foundation for this conversation, talked about presence, talked about dialogue in the form of professional communications, um, uh, talked uh, um, also a little bit about, um, uh, well, again, the objective reasonableness. But I think before we move on, maybe talk a little bit about, well, where does de-escalation fit into this? Um, is this just a, a scale that you start at point, you know, A, and you just continue to move up? Or like, what? how, how does that play out? Or what, maybe even what kinds of training um, are our officers also receiving? In addition to, here's how you implement force. More importantly, perhaps, how, how are we avoiding having to implement that force when we're dealing with a potentially non-compliant or even combative subject out on the street. Yeah, de-escalation is a, a hot topic. You know, it, it's it's a term that's that's out there we have in our policy and it's extremely important. But I think the important thing to to know and remember about de-escalation is it's not a specific set of tactics or phrases that are out there, it's a desired end goal. You know, we want to be able to de-escalate a situation as much as we can. It does, you know, put an emphasis for the officers to try different things or to be able to think about different things. But ultimately, we don't control that. The subject has to be, you know, willing to actually abide by what we're, you know, ordering them to do or asking them to do in the situation. So, you know, using time distance, our relative positioning, our communication skills to de-escalate and 
have to use either no force, which is the ultimate goal, or a lower level of force. So I think another misconception is that de-escalation, if, if de-escalation is achieved, that means no force is used. Yes, that would be best case scenario, but that's not always de-escalation. You know, if, if we have a deadly force situation, right, we may be authorized and meet all the criteria to be able to use deadly force against someone. But because we used good tools, we had, you know, additional equipment there, we were able to use distance, cover, and our tactics and our communication skills with officers as well as with the subject, we might be able to use a lower level of force, say a taser, and still be able to achieve the goal of taking the subject into custody with a lower level of force. We may have been justified to shoot them, but because we were able to use all those things we talked about and deploy a taser and it was effective, we can still now get that subject into custody and that's a lower level of force. That's de-escalation too. So it, it is kind of a scale depending on what um, we're presented with as well, what we have available to us. You know, time constraints are a big uh, thing in there too. We may not have the time to, to de-escalate. If we, if we delay our response to something, we could get hurt or somebody else could get hurt if we didn't act. So, yeah, we want to do that and we definitely train that, um, you know, in a variety of our trainings, you know, throughout every single year that we do in-house training. We emphasize that, um, but it's it's not, hey, you have to say this phrase or you have to use this specific tactic. It's going to be sure. dependent on what we're presented with. So, in other words, it's there, there isn't necessarily the system of, well, before you can do this, you must have first attempted to do these four or five other things. Um, this, this system that, you know, that, that is implemented here in Wisconsin and that is trained on and that you've talked about allows for officers to be able to implement and employ a variety of, of tacti tactics or options that are best suited to the situation, if I'm understanding that. Yeah, there's correctly. this fancy term called preclusion, which... Every recruit is trained in here in Wisconsin that basically says you need not escalate or walk through each step of the intervention options, presence, dialogue, controlled alternatives, protective alternatives, and, and deadly force in that order in every call. No, you go to that level of force that is necessary to be able to de-escalate or deal with the particular threat that is presented to us. And I just add that Yes, I'm biased when it comes to Wisconsin law enforcement, but I think that Wisconsin has really led the way nationwide when it comes to training, both at the basic recruit level, uh, but also for our even our seasoned veterans. And I say that because de-escalation has really been baked into our recruit academy material for a very, very long time, for the you know length of my career. And just look at the system itself, where it begins. It, it begins with that presence. It begins with that verbalization. And then when verbalization fails, you, you work your way up to control alternatives. Um, unless you have a deadly, you know, a deadly threat present itself, well, then you go right up to deadly force. Um, but yes, it is baked in. The term de-escalation is used much more today, obviously, than it was 16 years ago when I when I started, and that's a, it's a very good thing. Um, but yeah, it's it's been with us, and we talk a lot about it. We train a lot on it. Training has been adjusted a little bit here and there as well. Um, yeah. Well, let me ask this then: through that lens of preclusion and some of the other uh, things that you talked about, what are some of the more um, I don't know, some of the, the, the more important uh, considerations or factors that an officer would likely be considering when de trying to determine what level of force am I going to uh, need to employ in this specific incident? Like like what's going on through the, I, I know we're not mind readers, but what's going on through an officer's, in an officer's mind as they're dealing with some of these or faced with an issue? Well, let me just talk about like on the front end. I think de-escalation, getting back to that point, and then what type of force we're going to use begins with the call coming in. Right at the beginning, they need to assess whether or not they're going to respond to it. And they need in their approach considerations to think about, all right, just because somebody calls doesn't necessarily mean we're going to respond, or we may still respond, but we may, uh, in, you know, handle that call in a, in a way unexpected, you know, from whatever that caller had hoped for us. 
And so in, in those approach considerations, we're thinking about, all right, am I going to go emergent? Am I going to go just, you know, driving the speed limit? How many officers do I need with me? Is this a solo call or one where I need backup? Um, and then, you know, as they approach the house, where am I going to park? You know, is it a pretty tense situation where I'm not even going to approach the house and I'm maybe going to make a phone call and try to get that person to come out? I mean, there's so many different variables and things that an officer needs to think about at the point that a call is received and the officer is dispatched um, that helps inform and shape the officer's response even before they show up on the scene. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then they get there and you're, you're talking with somebody, you know, like Ben said, what information do you have? You know, have you dealt with the subject before, right? We talk about subject history. Hey, we're going to so-and-so's house. We've been there before. You know, we use our in-house records a lot and we have different, you know, people that we deal with frequently. And we're like, hey, if we're going to deal with John today, uh, last time we dealt with John, he wasn't in a good mood. He was under the influence, whatever it is for that subject. And we can use that and go, all right, maybe I want more resources here. Last time it didn't go well. The call sounds like it's going down that same lane. Let's get more officers there because last time we were behind the eight ball because we didn't know that at the time. And then you're talking to them, um, you're reading people. You know, we're talking and interviewing people. We're also looking at body language. What are they saying? What are they doing? Those types of things. We're looking for, we call them pre-attack indicators. So things like if they have that thousand yard stare, you know, if you've ever seen somebody where they're, they might be looking at you, but they're not really looking at you. They're looking through you. They're not there present, right? That would be something that we would be aware of and go, okay, what's going on here? Is this mental health? Is it drug induced? Are they thinking about, hey, I'm going to attack and I'm just waiting for the right moment? Um, and they're in their head going through what they want to do. You know, boxer stance, you know, if somebody's getting ready to, to attack us, we'll generally see those pre-attack indicators, right? They could be clenching their fists. They could be shifting their weight. You know, those types of things that we're reading going, hey, we're here, we're dealing with this. You know, we might need to go hands-on with this individual and take them into custody or detain them, but we're seeing these things. That could change what we, how would we, we would respond to that individual or maybe take some preemptive action to go, okay, this person's getting really squirrely. They're, we're seeing some of these pre-attack indicators. All right, Ben and I are there and we're going to, let's detain this guy, right? Until we get some more officers there because we have other people to talk to, there's other circumstances we need to address with that call. Okay, we're going to try to preemptively um, restrict their ability to attack us or flee. So we're going to put them maybe in handcuffs for that um, until we figure out what next step is with those. So yeah, I think it's it's really important for, for our officers getting that experience too. You know, how a brand new officer in field training, you know, I can think of times where in field training and then, you know, the more senior officer was telling me like, hey, we've, we've been to this house before. Like you haven't met this person yet. Just be aware of this or this. And that can be anything from, you know, hey, we've been there for this same complaint before to, hey, last time we went there or this person, when they're intoxicated, they like to fight. So let's get another officer rolling. I haven't dealt with them, you know, I hadn't dealt with them at that particular point. That information from your fellow officer, your trainer, dispatch um, is really important to helps keep us safe and helps us enlist the resources or tools that we might need or think we need. Better to have them there and not need them than we're behind the eight ball and now we got to hurry up and get something else there. Yeah, we are often behind the eight ball, which is why it's so important to size up the situation in advance, to size up the subject that we're dealing with, because action is always faster than reaction. And that's oftentimes what we're doing. We're responding. And so it's so important to be able to key in on some of those subject factors and also some of the officer factors. You know, sure. every officer here is different, has different abilities, has many of the same tools. Um, but you know, there's a lot of diversity there as well. And we need to pay very, very close attention to all of those factors so that we're not behind the eight ball, right? And we are able to respond as quickly as we possibly can, while at the same time using the least amount of force necessary to be able to detain and effect arrests and things like that. Sure. 
Well, you bring up a lot of things. I mean, clearly there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into this, to the decision yeah. to um, either use implement force or to when to de-escalate or how to escalate or all these different things. There must be a tremendous amount of information that an officer is needing to process as they're responding or faced with a decision like this. You cited one, one of the tools or, um, you know, one of the levels of force uh, being a taser. So maybe through the lens of that, as I'm considering all of these things that, that you're talking about and citing, if an officer is determining whether or not a uh, taser deployment would be appropriate, I'm imagining that they have to very quickly be determining, okay, is this comporting with the Constitution, uh, Fourth Amendment? Um, does this comply with with state law governing use of force issues? Um, is this in line with departmental policy that, that mm-hmm. exists? And am I am I prepared to be able to articulate as to why this was the appropriate use of, of force in this specific incident, given the the specific factors? So, um, and feel, correct me if I'm wrong, but it just seems like there is a tremendous amount of no, stuff going on, which uh, opens the door, I think, for a tremendous amount of scrutiny mm-hmm. a- afterward. Um, and actually, maybe that's a segue, John. Maybe you can talk a little bit about, or, or both of you, like what does that scrutiny from a department standpoint look like? I know that as the lead tactical officer, lead tactical instructor, you you look at every use of force and just make sure, again, it is falling in line with departmental policy, that um, we're not seeing trends that would allow for us to provide more tailored uh, instruction or training or individualized conversations with others. Maybe you can talk just a little bit about what that looks like. Yeah. So every report um, prior to being approved is looked at at least by a lieutenant or a captain before it gets moved on. And then after that initial review, so they're looking at it, one set of eyes is looking at it first, then myself or two other lieutenants who are use of force instructors, we look at it from, hey, we're just going to review the use of force. Was it appropriate? Was it within policy? Was it within training and standards? And you know, what I always start with is the report because like we're talking about, there's so much information that's going through. And if I look at the video, I might get some audio for it. I might get the initial dispatch, but I'm not going to have everything that the officer did that's on video. That's one view. Yeah, we we look at that pretty regularly for, for use of force incidents, but I'm looking at the report because that's the, the time where the officer is going to articulate everything that they knew and they thought about in that moment leading up or those moments leading up to, okay, this is the decision that I made to use force. Hey, this is what I knew going into the call. Maybe I didn't know, you know, from the video or the dispatch, hey, I've dealt with that person three times in the last couple of shifts, right? Well, the report would should reflect that and say, hey, this is what I had contact with him before. I knew this ahead of time. Um, going into it, this is what I saw. This is what I felt. This is what I understood or believed at the time. And this is what I did. So we're looking at the report first. Um, and then we, we use body cam, squad cam footage to supplement that review too, to give us a picture of, okay, this is what actually happened. Um, you know, on top of the report. Because like I said, the body cam and the squad camera are fixed. They're great tools that we have available, but they're not perfect and they don't show everything there too. You know, an analogy I always use is you think about sports. How many cameras are in a sports game? You know, I'm a hockey fan, so I'll use a hockey example. In the NHL game, there's like 50 to 60 cameras just for one hockey game. There's five cameras that look at just the net. So they have five cameras that are movable and in fixed positions to zoom in and look at, okay, did the puck cross the line? Is it a goal or is it not a goal, right? They have that many cameras to look at it, and they don't get it 100% right. And now we rely on one, two, three, maybe four cameras, depending on how many officers are there or what it would show, you know, and they're fixed. You can't move those around, too. They're, they're on the officer and where they have it, what they're doing. You know, if you're struggling with somebody, you know, you're not going to see a lot of the physical struggle from a body camera because if we go hands-on and now we're in close proximity, we're not going to see what their hands are doing, you know, from, from at least that view. There might be another view that we could see from there. So it's important for us to have that and have that for evidentiary and review process. But 
um, the report's going to be the big thing. And then we're, we're looking at it, okay, did it fall in line with our, our policy? Was was that appropriate for that particular call, and the, the level of a resistance or um, threat that the, the subject posed to that officer or the public? Yeah, I would encourage those that are listening to this or watching this to like take their thumb and hold it up in front of them and then just focus on their thumb. You know, the thumb will be in focus. But if you go, you know, outside like three degrees from your thumb, everything becomes blurry. Sure. And so, you know, to drive home what John is talking about with all these different cameras, oh, it's clear exactly what happened. But from the perspective of that officer, you need to think about what they could see and what they can't see just because of how we're made as humans. Uh, we, we don't want to expect the impossible from our officers. And that's why, you know, as use of force trainers, we go to some advanced training to be able to think through the biology and what's possible for the, you know, the human mind and body to be able to process um, so that there's accountability overall, um, but at the same time that we're not expecting too much of our officers, things that are not even possible for them. Yeah. You talked about the cameras. I, I, I I mean, at one point, I I wanted to bring those up and just say, hey, how much, if any, of a game changer uh, have our body cameras been since implementation in summer of 2016? I mean, I think we could make the argument like, oh, it's really helped us in tremendous ways, but it's not the it's it's not the silver bullet to understanding all of these issues. Um, it 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 can offer a perspective, but to your point, John, like it's it's limited in what it, it it can always provide for us if if I'm understanding that correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's why it's important to always, what we talk about here at Wasapedia is to hire for character, train for skill. Because, you know, when you're, when you're confronted with a no person, um, you know, you try to distance yourself from responding emotionally to that, but we're all human too. And if you don't come into this profession with a high amount of character, it can be very easy to go above and beyond what you should do as an officer. And, um, you know, that's, that's why we hire great people here. We give them a great amount of training so that they're when, when they're presented with difficult situations like that, they respond in the appropriate manner. And then even though we hire great people and we give them good training, there's still a need to look at every single use of force. Um, because we make mistakes, we're human, right? Sure. And I think it also helps us to be able to look at some of the trends so that we can adjust our training because we might see deficits like, oh, we've seen this a couple times this year. So let's put together some kind of tailored training around this to be able to improve and make sure that we don't continue to make some of these errors. And the errors often are not um, where an officer's use of force is unjustified or not justified, it's usually in the realm of like desirability. Like, did you really have to do that? Or was there some, some other tool or tactic or, you know, using some time and distance and sort of like slowing things down that could have resolved this in a different, different manner. We talk about justification versus desirability sure. a lot. So Ben, you, you've had a hand in um, updating, modifying, rewriting policy for the department for a number of years now. Like how how often is it necessary that there's revisions appropriate for our use of force policy? And I will just say, I think our use of force policy is number three hundred in our policy manual. Um, we can certainly it's available out online for anybody to go see our policy manual. We can link that um, uh, in in uh, in the description when we post this podcast out uh, if people are curious in in seeing that. But like how how frequent has it happened? I mean, maybe yeah. the more appropriate question is. How has use of force evolved and changed throughout the last 10, 15, 20 years or so? Well, I think because Wisconsin has done a really, really great job at, especially at the recruit level, at training and, and um, textbook development and things like that, we've been ahead of the time. And I think proof of that is the fact that we have not had to make substantial changes to our policies through the year. There have been some slight modifications to definitions and and we've had to sort of make explicit things that have been implied over the years. 
But all in all, just small changes here and there over the course of the last 16 years that I've been um, employed as an officer, uh, which I, like I said, it, it just, you know, gives weight to the fact that Wisconsin is doing a really, really good job when it comes to policy development and, you know, meeting national standard and state standard when it comes to what does professional law enforcement look like. Gotcha. Thank you. And John, I guess I would say as a follow-up to that, does that hold true also for um, for law enforcement use of force training uh, as well? Maybe not just the policy or definitions or things like that, but has the training of our officers uh, remain pretty similar throughout the years, or have we seen you know different advancements or an evolution rather of of use of force training in law enforcement uh, fields? Yeah, I, I think there's definitely been an, an evolution. I think it's it's small things, whether it's changes in you know equipment and technology that's available. You know, we talked about cameras when. Ben and I started, I think probably when you started too, the squad cameras were were there and they yeah, were we pretty- Yeah, we didn't have any when I started. So there you, there you go. I mean, you've, you've seen the evolution from, I remember when I started, it was VHS and DVD players. And then we got to the, the first arbitrator system that we had that was non, um, you know, a hard tape or disc based. Um, to now we have, you know, Axon and the body cameras. So an evolution in the technology that's there and adapting to those um, updates and those changes. The concepts have remained the same, um, but I think like Ben had mentioned too, the, the justification versus desirability. I think that's one thing that we've really emphasized too. When we can use our tools, our tactics, and our communication to our advantage, and we have the time and the ability to do that, the emphasis on, on using that when we can um, has been something we try to drive home and we review and can constantly update, you know, through our scenarios and through our training as well. Um, and I think the level of an amount of training that not only we receive, um, but deliver to and offer um, to our officers is, is a lot better. Like it, it, we've always had a very robust training um, budget here at Wausau PD and that's just been increased with the number of additional instructors that we have, you know, sending people to more specialized training to be able to bring that back to our department and bring a lot of those innovations and best practices back as well. Um, that really sets us up for success. Great. In, in the world of AI, VR, technology, sort of in that lane, you and I went to a conference, I think it was last year, right, where it was really technology-based. Mm -hmm. And I know, Ben, we've attended some other things as well where technology is becoming more and more um, a topic of conversation, uh, especially in the world of training. Where do you see maybe some of our department um, training going in terms of technology utilization? Um I mean, yeah. I know you've demoed a few different things. Yeah, and... I, we've looked at a number of different like VR and um, simulator-based training systems. There's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, they're typically very expensive. Um, it, it's something we've looked at and had a couple local. We had, you know, Axon we've looked at as well. And there's a lot of great technology out there. And being able to utilize that, if, if we were ever able to invest in that, I think it would give us a definitely a leg up and it's another option for us to use. Um, but it also doesn't replace in-person training, you know, being able to actually do the skills that can supplement, you know, um, training simulators and VR can definitely supplement and, and give us another way to get a lot of reps in. But then, you know, just like in Recruit Academy, you do the skills, you learn every single LESB certified, hey, you're going to do this move and this skill and it works perfect when you're in the gym, but then the very first time that you have to do that in the, out in the field, you're like, that was nothing like what I did in the dat room, you know, in the mats. It, doing it in the real world or even, hey, let's add some stress in a live scenario, those things change. So I, I don't think it'll, and nor do I think it should replace, you know, in-person training and, you know, using scenarios and the actual tools that we need to, to use. Um, it would just be a force multiplier for us to supplement what we already do. Gotcha. Thank you. Hey, I, I just want to shift gears just a, a, a little bit. Um, talking about 
media scrutiny of maybe some higher profile incidents that have happened around the country. Um, I think it's appropriate that we discuss things that, that come to light. I think in the interest of uh, improving our abilities within our profession and, and also in the interest of uh, uh, transparency, it's important to talk about those things. I will also then make the observation, and I'd be curious your thoughts, what does this sometimes perceived heightened scrutiny do on the officer, the frontline officer out there in the field when they're faced with making these really difficult decisions, processing that much information um, in, in a in a very short amount of time. Like, how do you see that playing out, or is is that a, a good thing, a bad thing, a negligible uh, effect? Um, thoughts at all? I think it definitely has an effect on officers. You know, when when something happens, whether it's here locally, um, you know, we've had some incidents that garnered local attention. We've had incidents that garner national attention as well um, in our area or something that's across the country. You know, we saw that probably the most recent large-scale one, the George Floyd incident. You know, that had ripple effects across all of law enforcement, and it didn't matter that it, it happened in Minnesota. Yeah, we're a state away, but that affected officers in California and Texas and Florida. Um, so it's important for us to learn from those and when they come up, um, look at it as how it affects us and what we would do in that situation. You know, if we, we've talked about those things in, in trainings too, um, more high profile incidents and go, okay, if this happened here, how would we respond? What do we train to respond, you know, in this type of situation, what would you do? And we'd put that and usually at shift level um, training for patrol for the bureau at their, their meetings. And you talk through that, you know, a big thing that we do with like field trainers is the, the, if then thinking it's, if this happens, then I'm going to do this. You know, if this scenario came thinking about what you're, you're going to do ahead of time, set you up for success. You know, similar to the quote Ben gave for the atomic habits, one I use regularly in presentations is you don't rise to the occasion. You're going to fall to your lowest level of preparedness or training. If you've never thought about a scenario, your mind is going to go to, hey, what's the closest thing I've ever been involved in or experienced and start there. And if you've never experienced anything like that, you're already behind the eight ball. And if we're reacting, that puts us further behind. You know, if we've thought about it, hey, if I'm presented with this scenario, here's how I'm going to act. You know, we, we talked about a, uh, more, more recently uh, an active threat event, you know, and okay, how it played out is not how we train. And we talked about that and said, this is why we reemphasized everybody. This is why we train the way we do. And this is, what you need to think about. Like if you're presented with this, you can't wait until that happens. If this happens, here's what I'm going to do. And that needs to be your choice. Like nobody's going to be out there. I'm not going to be out there in the field telling, hey, you got to go do this. You got to go do that. Like we trust our officers to make those decisions and we try to give them the training um, to be able to act appropriately and think ahead of time. Like, okay, if I'm presented with that, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, I think that now more than ever, we operate in a fishbowl, and there is very little opaqueness to that fishbowl now. Um, every officer has a camera. Almost every resident and citizen and guest of WASA we deal with has a camera on their cell phone. You know, businesses have cameras. Much the overwhelming majority of the things that we do um, are captured, audio and and visual. And I think the the silver lining to some of the public scrutiny and all of the available video of law enforcement actions out there is that we can, like John talked about, we can take those incidents and we can learn from them vicariously. And I think John does a really good job along with some of the other instructors is pulling out some of those, whether it's, you know, a officer's body camera or a civilian's, you know, recording of the incident so that we can on our end during a briefing session or a, a monthly meeting to be able to examine that use of force and learn from it. 
if there were mistakes made, our hope is that we don't make those same mistakes. So I don't look as, at the fishbowl as a negative thing, and I think most of our officers wouldn't as well. I think it adds accountability, and it also makes us better because we're able to see and learn and you know, we'll learn things when we're doing things out there on the street, but we can learn through other people as well. Perfect. Yeah, I like that. That's a that's a great benefit for us. John, I was going to ask, and Ben, you'll certainly have a perspective on this as well, but um, there might be a misconception out there is uh, surrounding how often officers are implementing force. I know Every you day, track that all information. The time. See, and that's what I'm afraid of, I think. Well, when you, you go into an elementary classroom, you know, what's the first question you ask? Well, you yeah, asked? I taught D.A.R.E. for eight years, and that's how what many people it? have you shot. Exactly. <laughs> um, and and I, I don't think that that's limited to elementary students. No, I, it's not. I would imagine a lot of people have that question. Like, I wonder how many how many times uh, that officers had to, had to use their firearm. Mm -hmm. But really, what are, I mean, what are the numbers? Um, it might surprise yeah. some people. Yeah, so I pulled, like, the last three numbers – so overarching for 2023, we had over 40,000 calls for service. And in those 40,000, we had 383 use of force incidents. I think it's also important, we define a use of force incident as any physical force above compliant handcuffing. So that's making initial contact, you know, grabbing a hold of somebody and maybe forcing their arm behind their back that would be a reportable use of force for our department. So there's a lot of things that are very, very low level. Escort hold is the, the category that's most common and has been ever since I've been involved in instructing or um, use of force reviews. That's been the highest category because that's how we establish contact with somebody. So that's less than 1% of all calls for service here in the city will result in any level of force, you know, and that's consistent with like the, the numbers that are out there nationally say roughly, you know, under 1% of all police and law, uh, civilian interactions result in any level of force. But what they're tracking are also the much higher levels of force. They, those are different than what we're tracking. So we're tracking more than what those numbers are counting. And we're still below 1% of all interactions. Um, so for like the last three years for taser deployments, so actually deploying a taser, firing the probes um, at somebody, we had 14 in 2020, 14 in 2021, 9 in 2022, and 16 in 2023. And that was for the whole year? That was for, for the years? entire year. It wasn't, per, yeah, it wasn't per day, it wasn't per month. That's for the entire year of each one of those. Yeah, and how many patrol officers do we have? Well, we have, when we're fully staffed, we should have about 42 patrol 42. officers. So the overwhelming majority of patrol officers don't deploy a taser in a year. They might go a couple of years without deploying the taser. Sure. Um, that's not because they weren't in situations where they were justified in using it. But like we talked about at the very beginning, we're able to resolve issues most often with presence and dialogue. So do you think in your own personal experiences or in conversations with others, do you think that those numbers might surprise some people? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I remember it. I've had one taser deployment in 15 years. I've had plenty of circumstances mm -hmm. where I could have deployed it, but I had one and it was my first one in my entire career was last year. Wow. I've had a handful. Yeah. You must and, be the better communicator. Uh, <laughs> well, I think it's, it's just the circumstances that presented itself. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. I've been present when yeah. it's been deployed, but I haven't had to actually deploy it in until my 15th year in law enforcement. You know, and I remember telling some some friends and family, and like, oh, yeah, I had a taser deployment. Like, oh, what number is that? I'm like, one. And they were completely shocked. They're like, what? I'm like, well, yeah, I fired it in training, and, and yeah. I've done mm – -hmm training cartridges and I've done instructor cartridges, you know, deploying them in those and scenarios, but in the field, it was one. And they're like, wow, I thought, well, then they asked like, well, how many do you have a year? I'm like, usually 10 to 15 is probably average, you know, per year with those. But they're like, really? Like I would have thought it would have been one a day or sure. one a month mm -hmm. too. Well, I think so, it harkens back to what you started off at the beginning of our conversation today is, um, you know, there, there may be instances in which we would, according to policy, according to our legal authority, be, be able or authorized or, um, or otherwise be able to implement force in that situation. 
but is it desirable? Are there other ways for us to resolve this situation as opposed to a taser deployment? And it sounds like in 14 other instances, there were there was another way that you were able to to accomplish that. It made me think about last year, I was fortunate enough to be able to go um, to Germany for a, 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 an international police exchange program. And so I stayed with a host family there, a uh, police officer family, and um, you know had some tours and did some ride-alongs. But one one tour that we did was of uh, of the SWAT team for that state, their tactical response unit, and I was in the northern part of Germany in Schleswig-Holstein, and so it's a statewide SWAT team or, or, or tactical team. Now it's important to note that patrol officers with the state police they don't carry taser devices. That was something new to me. I thought that that this was something that they would be carrying, but they don't. But the SWAT members did. And so when I saw that on our tour, I was like, oh, these guys have have tasers because I see them right on their vests. And I uh, was speaking with one of the, the SWAT members like, oh, I see you have the, the taser device here. Like, how do you like it? And they were really excited to say, yep, we've been demoing this device for eight, nine months now. Um, love it. It's awesome. It's great. And then I was curious and said, like the kid, like, how many times do you tase people? So I asked, how many deployments have you had? They said, well, we haven't had any yet. I'm like, hold on a second. Your, your entire team, you're a statewide SWAT team going all over. Um, and you haven't had one and, and you've had it for nine, 10 months. You haven't had a single taser deployment. They said, no, every time we, we pull it out and just display it, we get compliance right away from from subjects. Um, and I think that that is akin to what we we see here. We're trying to resolve things through that presence, right? We have a uniformed officer um, that has equipment and gear that is designed to help them control a combative subject uh, with the least amount of force possible, but while ensuring safety for officers and subjects and citizens alike. And um, that was an it was an interesting experience for me to see that. Yeah. yeah. At the I, end of the day, it's a fantastic tool. Yeah. It's just we don't need to use it very often. Like you point out, sometimes just the removal of it from the holster and turning it on. Now there's this loud pitch noise with the newest generation of Taser that alerts them that something's coming. It's a little yeah. bit like Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it might be helpful for our listeners and viewers, too, to know, like, when can we use a Taser? And we can use it for active resistance, assault of behavior, or the threat. So you can't use it for those that are just passive and non-compliant. Like you're giving them directions and they're like, no, you can't then just tase them, right? There needs to be some behavior that physically counteracts the officer's control efforts and creates a risk of harm to the officer or somebody else. And, and, and that's when we can choose to use it. But we oftentimes do some empty hand control type stuff. You know, we blanket the arm, uh, maybe an escort hold. And, and then if there's some resistive tension and there's some fighting, you know, we want to reduce injuries to ourselves and the subject. And so we might disengage, transition to a taser and use a taser to be able to incapacitate them. Fancy term is neuromuscular incapacitation. It causes them to stiffen up and they can't do anything. And then what we try to do in the five second duration of that cycle is to cuff under power. So while they're immobilized, we have officers come in and they'll handcuff while the person is energized. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sounds exciting. It is exciting. You don't want to experience it. No. But I would rather experience a taser over maybe what you're going to talk about next, and that's OC. Yeah, OC or I, pepper I, I, spray. Yeah. Yeah, so same thing. I mean, for the last three years, uh, 2020, three. 2021, three. 2022, we had an increase, four. <laughs> and, or excuse me, 2022 was four. 2023, one. So now here's where I might same beat thing. you. Zero for me. I think I've had one. Zero. Well, let me no, ask zero? you this. Two. Because I, I, it, I've it, had zero. It gets so, every, I mean, everybody gets the effect well, of pepper spray. Well, that was going to be my question. Used. How many times have you been pepper sprayed? Yeah. The one, Inadvertently, been, yeah. right? Yeah. I've gotten like, a good dose of it once. Yeah. 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 It's not fun. Not, not pleasant. Not fun. So been on It's the about a 45 minute recovery. You know, if you're tased after five seconds, it's almost like it never happened. Sure. Well, <laughs> yeah. Both have their the uses. The memory lingers, right? The, <laughs> the memory does linger. Yeah. Well, let's, 
I, I don't know. Did you have more on OC or? No, um, that was it. And, and really the requirements for OC use are, are going to be in the same category. Same as, as a taser. Yep. So it falls within the control alternative. Uh, but like I said, it's active resistance, continued active resistance or assault of behavior. Um, obviously, if you're posed with a deadly threat, I think we're going to talk about firearms next. It's it's a different story. You probably don't want to be pulling out your taser if you're presented with a deadly threat. Yeah, let's talk about that. Let, let's hear what you have. I, I, numbers on that or just thoughts as we're talking about deadly force implementation of that. Yeah, sure. First, I think defining deadly force is important. So we have a definition for um, for deadly force. It's the intentional use of a firearm which creates a high probability of death or great bodily harm. So we train with our firearms regularly. That's the tool that we train with um, if we need to use deadly force. Now, that can also be, it says, other instruments. So it could be something that we have. A lot of officers will carry a knife or a Leatherman-type tool on them, a multi-tool on them, and they may have a situation where they would be justified to use that. But we don't train that. You know, we don't train... With that, there could be situations where a vehicle could be used as a, a as a deadly weapon. Um, so that was in there, but we're not out training that either. And then the behavior, well, you know, what gives us the justification to use deadly force? Very similar. It's behavior that has caused or imminently threatens to cause death or great bodily harm to you or another person or persons. So what's the subject doing? You know, and does it meet that criteria? Okay, then we could use deadly force. You know, and for the last three years or four years, so 2020, we did have an officer-involved shooting, and then we had eight fired ar- firearm deployments where we actually fired, or excuse me, nine. So the one officer involved, and then we had eight we used to dispatch animals that were injured. Okay. So like a deer runs into yep. a car, is injured on the side of the road, yep. that would fall into that category Correct. for a discharged firearm. Yep, and... Thankfully, since 2020, um, we have not. So 12 animals were dispatched in 2021, um, 2022, 18, and 2023, 10. You know, so we do have our firearms. When we draw and direct our firearm at somebody, we count that as a reportable use of force because okay. we want to review that. You know, if we're drawing our firearm, we need to be justified and we may need to use that. So that we review those just the same um, as any other use of force. You know, obviously a, an officer-involved shooting has a, a much higher and should have a much higher level of scrutiny and investigation into that actual use of that against an individual. Um, but again, it, it's not, thankfully, it's not common that we have those. Um, you know, an analogy I heard, was listening to a podcast, and what I heard is, you know, if you train for the 1%, it makes the 99% easy. And, you know, that's what we're doing with all of our training. You know, we train with our firearms. But again, it's, it's something even for any law enforcement across, you know, the country, it's not a high likelihood that you'll be involved in something like that during your career. Or, and thankfully so. But if we train for it, then if we're ever presented with that, we have the training behind understanding what we can do and we're proficient with that tool as well. So, yeah. Well, great. Well, thanks for sharing those those numbers. I'm, I I would like to ask, maybe just by way of closing, sort of as we're winding down a little bit, what do you think the future of use of force training um, policies, things of that nature? Do you see if it holds for for us here at Wausau PD, but maybe in Wisconsin as well, like? Is it going to be pretty static? Are we going to see pretty severe or, or, or large advancements in technology use? I mean, we talked a little bit about that, but what do you think the future holds for use of force in law enforcement fields? I think there's always a push um, to have new technology that's out there and give us more options. Um, some of it is great, and we've implemented some of those. And some of it, you know, in theory, might work really well, but in actual practice, it, it doesn't. There have been things that have been out there, and then they failed. And um, hey, they're not in use anymore. Or it's hey, that's too great of a risk. You know, we thought it would be this level, but really, in practical use, it's not what we thought it was going to be. And so it's not widely um, adopted. So. You know, I don't, I don't see anything right at this moment that's on the horizon. Like, hey, this is the next thing that 
is going to be a game changer for us, but we're always open to looking at those. That's one thing I think that, you know, we have a benefit of being able, you know, I have a benefit of, hey, if I see something, I can come and say, hey, this is really beneficial. You know, can I work it into the budget that I'm responsible for to, to, to get for our department and give us another tool and be able to train with it? And we've done that, you know, in my career compared to what we had when I started versus what we have now, we have a lot of additional tools available for us for situations that I, I can look back and go, man, I wish I really would have had that how many years ago dealing with whoever. So, and I think the other thing we have going for us too is Wisconsin is is very proactive that if there's changes that need to be made, you know, law enforcement standard boards, training, um, is not afraid to make those changes at all. You know, they would, they're not afraid to be on the forefront of, we need to make this change as a profession, so let's implement this, and here's the best way to do it. And take input from the end users. It's not just, hey, somebody in a legislative body is making changes. Like, we can look at it, and we can make changes within our profession, too. I think that happens more often than the legislator having to say, hey, we need a law to say, you can't do this, or you have to do this, that our training and standards look at it and go, no, we need to adjust the best practices have changed, whether it's because of technology, whether it's because of tools or tactics um, that are out there, they will make those changes um, before it gets to the point of the legislator saying, hey, you sure. have to do this. Yeah, I would agree. I don't forecast significant changes when it comes to the rules of our engagement, whether that's at the policy level or at the law level. I mean, we have some had some recent legislation with duty to intervene, duty to report, which are good things for law enforcement. But to John's point, I think that, you know, Notable advancements are going to be made on the training side when it comes to technology, maybe on some of the tools that were provided too, um, with some of the leaps and bounds that AI is making in the contemporary scene. Um, yeah, I, I know that that's going to change some of the ways in which we we train. And, and if at some point before I retire, we're able to retire the firearm because, you know, Axon, for example, has come up with some instrument that's able to meet that deadly force threat in every situation. Well, obviously, it's something we'd be open to. Um, but we'll see. I mean, I was a, a bit of a skeptic when you and I went down to the International Association of Chiefs of Police Conference in yeah. Chicago, what, six years ago now? Yeah. And they had an interview room where the officer was talking to the subject and their boast at that point in time where it was at the conclusion of this interview, when they hit stop, the report's going to write itself. And I said, absolutely no, not, no that's not going to happen. There's just too much nuance, things that need to be interpreted. But I'm telling you, um, when I look at where AI is at today, we were there. In yes. fact, yesterday yes. we were yes. we were there, and I think that's going to translate into some of our use of force training as well. And certainly, there's the component of advancements in the technology that we carry, the tools that we carry. So we'll see. We're open to doing things better. I appreciate those perspectives. Um, anything else that we really should be hitting that that we didn't talk about on this topic? I would just add and maybe drive home the point that there is sanctity to life, right? And the last thing that any officer should want to do getting in this job is to want to use force, is to have to deploy their, their firearm. Um, it's a bad day for, for everybody. And with that said, that's why we have this system and all these policies to make sure that you know, we're doing things the right way with that sanctity of, of life in mind. I think that's great. You know, that's, that's enshrined a lot in, in the training that we have too, you know, and one thing we didn't talk about that's on that line, we have, we teach like the priorities of life, right? you know, and that's for officers to consider. And, you know, when you get into this profession, I remember being interviewed by a field trainer um, for the job. And they asked you, that was one of the questions like, okay, what do you think about this? And would you be able to do it? Most people don't think about that every day, which is a good thing. Um, but that's something we have to think about. We have to be prepared to act if we're called to do so. 
um, because that's what the public expects. You know, the priorities of life are there's hostages and then you have innocent, the general public, then you have officers. So we're acknowledging that we're putting other people's lives ahead of our own because we have the tools, the training to be able to address those situations that most people don't. And then the subject and we hold them, they're, they're important, but if their actions are a threat to us or the general public or a hostage, we're saying, hey, your, your safety is not higher than those because you're threatening them. But like I said, we're, we're acknowledging we're putting other people's safety before our own and officers have to make that decision beforehand um, as well. Great. Thank you. Well, I appreciate both of you uh, uh, sitting down today to talk about this topic. There's certainly a lot that goes into it. I'm sure we could continue to talk about it in a lot of different ways and from a lot of different angles. But uh, I appreciate um, you know the professionalism with which you approach this topic, and it certainly makes our department a better place, and it makes our, our community safer because you've prepared the officers well to do that. Um, hopefully those that are watching, those that are listening, found this uh, information uh, helpful. Uh, and, and educational. Let us know if there's other things that you'd like us to discuss on future episodes of the podcast. Thanks, guys, for coming in. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.